search the web for leadership in the NHS and you'll find that it's a hot topic and has been for many years. There's even an NHS Leadership Academy. Click through the links and you'll find something interesting. For all the talk of leadership, there is almost no convergence in what leadership is, even less clarity about what it looks like in practice. So here is a simple definition. Leadership happens when people in organisations demonstrate that what matters is what matters around here. This means having a clear, constant and unifying purpose. See if you can spot who's providing leadership by this definition in the following video. What happens to them and what does this reveal about the nature of the change which is required to create a high quality and affordable health and care system? In these accounts, confidentiality has been maintained by altering certain details so that individual patients and staff cannot be identified. The accounts do not relate to one particular ward, emergency department or hospital trust. All events have been appropriately reported within the hospitals and to the CQC where necessary. As a new member of a department, I was expected to start work after only one day of shadowing a junior member of staff. I was given no training or extra supervision, even though this was a completely new speciality for me. During my time on that ward, I saw several deaths, which I thought shouldn't have happened, or at least shouldn't have happened in the way that they did. With every incident that I witnessed and felt was a problem, I reported it to senior members of the nursing team, um, again in line with hospital policy and in line with my code of conduct. This is an account of the shift on a ward when I was a newly qualified nurse. There was a lack of experienced nurses on the ward, so I didn't have the same support that I did normally, and there wasn't enough equipment. There was only one blood pressure machine, and there should have been three, um, etc. On the shift, several of my patients didn't get a wash that day, and for one of them, that was the third day in a row that he hadn't received a wash due to staff's shortages. One patient had to go home without their tablets because there wasn't a doctor available to prescribe them. I had to tell another man that I couldn't help him get dressed because I didn't have time. And then, perhaps the most troubling one to me, was a lady who, was, who had to remain in bed. She had diarrhoea, I hadn't been able to get the bedpan in time, and I had to leave her, sat in her own excrement for over half an hour because there was no one else available to come and help me clean her up. I have many shifts like this, this is not one particularly significant one. Um, others involved being frustrated by losing patients' notes, by drug cupboards not being stocked properly, general systemic failures that hindered my day-to-day -day nursing work. Well, I didn't come into nursing to provide such shoddy care to my patients. I was embarrassed to think that I was the nurse who left somebody in their own excrement for more than half an hour. However, what can we do? If nurses are left unsupported, understaffed and with not the right equipment, you have to just carry on regardless. The only thing that you can do is to report what's happening in the hope that people will listen and change the systems that are affecting us. So that's what I did and did it absolutely by the book following the Trust's whistleblowing procedures. My ward manager responded quite well at first. She was really supportive and we discussed my concerns openly and honestly. She gave me advice and assistance. But as soon as I touched on concerns that were above her remit, she encouraged me to go and speak to more senior members of the line management team as per the Trust's protocol. Um, but it was only after I started doing this that she, uh, our relationship changed and she started acting negatively towards me and seemed to be disappointed in what I was doing. I got the impression that she was getting blamed for what I was saying. So managers were taking my concerns and instead of seeing them as systemic failures, they were blaming the sister and thinking, 
oh, it must just be that ward, and it must just be that sister, and it's all her fault. As a result, I started to get sort of psychological pressure um, not to say anything because the ward sister was even crying on shift when I was there and I knew that it was because of what I was doing. So on the one hand, I didn't want to upset my ward sister, but then on the other hand, I was leaving patients in their own excrement for long periods of time. I was unable to give people pain relief on time. So again, I was in an invidious position, and the only thing that I could do, that I should do, in terms of my nursing and midwifery code of conduct, was report what I was seeing. So I carried on regardless. I felt sad, really, because my intentions were good. All I wanted to do was improve patient care. And what I'd achieved so far was upsetting my ward sister, who I actually respected and who'd helped and supported me in my first few months of being a nurse. So on the one hand, I wanted to stop doing what I was doing. And on the other hand, when I turned up to work day after day, seeing the same problems of cost-cutting measures and target culture, making patient safety and patient care um, diminish, that I knew I had to do something, and the only thing I could do was carry on doing what I was doing. I received several responses. Some of my peers thought I was an upstart, and that I shouldn't be doing what I was doing. On one occasion, I was actually stopped from reporting an incident by a member of staff who said I shouldn't do it. Some, a minority of my peers, were encouraging and agreed with what I was doing, but only in secret because they were too scared to speak out themselves for fear that they would lose their job or um, have some kind of negative feedback. Um, the managers at first would give me sort of a patronising debrief and, and treated me as if it was my coping mechanisms that were the problem and they just gave me a pat on the shoulder and said that it was okay, that I would be better. Um, other managers completely denied that what I was saying was true. I was told on several occasions that, oh well, the patient probably would have died anyway which I think is missing the point somewhat. And um, they, they were insinuating that I was making a mountain out of a molehill. And then um, the most sort of hurtful reaction was when they told me I was upsetting other members of staff and that I was the problem. I believe that most of the people responded in this way because they were scared. They had perhaps seen the same things that I'd seen and thought what I was thinking. But for fear of losing their job or negative repercussions, they decided to sweep the dirt under the carpet. They were living in a permanent state of moral dissonance and I was threatening their ability to deny what was happening. In terms of management, they seemed to try to silence me right from the beginning. Even though I was following hospital concerns procedure and had good, only good intentions and was only raising things about systemic problems leading to patient safety being at risk, I wasn't pointing the finger at anyone or accusing anyone of bad practice. Some of the managers tried to silence me by lulling me into a false sense of security and saying, this is the way things are here, you'll get used to it. You just need a bit of support. Others told me that made me feel that I didn't understand the bigger picture and that, as a junior member of STAR, I really shouldn't be meddling in such things and that I should just keep my mouth shut. Um, when these tactics didn't work and I sort of seemed quite persistent and was still trying to raise these concerns and saying, I'm sure something's wrong here, it turned personal and they started attacking my own professionalism and my competency. This time it worked and I crumbled. When my professionalism was questioned, I was affected quite dramatically both at work, 
and at home. I thought that I must not be as self-aware as I thought I was. I thought maybe that I was a terrible person and I hadn't realised that all my life I'd been upsetting people and not realised it. Um, I was a shadow of my former self and I was struggling to cope. So I had to make a decision as to what to do and I knew that I couldn't carry on working in that environment if I wanted to blow the whistle a whistle that they didn't want to hear. So, but I also knew that I couldn't live with myself if I didn't continue to blow the whistle about a dangerous system until somebody listened. I felt that the only option was to take it to the highest level, so I sent my concerns to the chief executive of the hospital. However, I also knew that I was not brave enough to do that whilst I'm still a member of the Trust. So simultaneously I handed in my notice. I didn't really get a response from the Chief Executive and I wasn't satisfied that my concerns were going to be listened to. Therefore I felt the only option left was to take it even higher and report it to the CQC which is the Care Quality Commission. The first time that I contacted them, I was told that they don't receive complaints and that I had to formulate all the information I had into relevant subcategories and report them to the necessary agencies and that they only investigate certain things. I explained that I had a lot of documented evidence all confidential, confidentiality maintained in terms of patients so they could read it at their will. Or if I could meet with somebody and just explain what my concerns were, um, that would be great. But they said that there was no such system for this to happen and that I had to do what they were telling me. It had taken so much courage to ring them up and then to be told that they weren't really going to help me or support me with this and that I had to go away and do yet more work and give it to them, I sort of felt really disheartened and I didn't know who to turn to next. Um, obviously, the only other way to go would have been to contact the media. And I did contemplate this, but this was a big threat to my registration and being so passionate as I am about nursing, I didn't want to lose my nursing registration. So, luckily, I decided to contact the CQC again. This time, I asked to speak to the Chief Executive, and within an hour, somebody called me back and told me that I could send them all the information that I have in the current form, and that I don't need to rewrite it or subcategorise it, and that somebody would investigate it, which is what happened. After the CQC read my notes, they immediately instigated an inspection of the hospital trust, and unsurprisingly, um, the trust failed, which worked to reassure me that my concerns had been real. And as a result of media attention and the CQC's visit, several members of the senior management team resigned. No, unfortunately I don't, because a lot of the incidents that I report relate not to individual members of staff, but to a system that's flawed. And unfortunately, we still, in this country, have a system of targets and um, cost-cutting measures. And until these are changed, I don't believe that even with new people in senior management roles at this hospital trust or other hospital trusts that I've witnessed will change. Um, well, I think that any nurse is bound to say something by their code of conduct. 
if they see somebody acting um, against the patient's needs or rights, um, that if they see dangerous practice or a system that doesn't work, that they have to say something. However, whistleblowing, unless people listen to what you're saying, um, doesn't necessarily achieve anything and in fact can cause more harm than good. In my instance, unless something good happens from what I'm trying to do now, so far all that I've managed to do by whistleblowing is damage my own mental and physical health, lose a job and um, doubt myself. So, if I was to meet someone who was thinking about whistleblowing, I would half encourage them because I just, I believe you haven't really got an option. If you've seen something bad, you've got to do something about it. But I would warn them that it, it might not work and it might cause them detriment. So if it was a government, if it was a legal requirement for people to whistleblow, I think this would only work if the people who are listening to the whistleblowing open their ears. I think that if I was blowing a whistle about an individual member of staff, that managers would be very interested in that and very keen to listen to what I was saying because I think it's something that's quite easy for them to solve. Um, therefore, they would be willing to listen to me. I think that the whistle they don't want to hear is one that may criticise um, an entire system because day on day, uh, managers in particular go to work with a belief structure. And if I'm questioning their belief structure, then it's very difficult for them to take it. Um, and also, because changing the system is such a big ask, they sort of can't believe that that's what you're really asking them to do. And they sort of come back at you saying, but what can we do? This is the system we're in. And they never seem to understand that what I'm saying is, yeah, the system we're in is wrong. Let's change it. If everybody involved in healthcare had the same aim, the same priority, which was purely what do patients need, not do we, not what do we think they need, or what does the media think that they need, or what do we want them to need, or what have we got that we can offer them. Instead, if we were saying what do people actually want and what do they need, and then all our services were based around this, I think that everything else would fall into place. Obviously, there would be um, financial restraints, but we have them in whatever system we're in. But at least if our aim is universal, we would all be able to work together in a team and achieve a better aim, uh, a better goal, I think. Um, I feel that the NHS at the moment is very... Um, target based. It, it's um, prove what you do, it's who's to blame if something goes wrong, it's not an open culture of um, being able to try new things and uh, do what's maybe individual to one patient but not suitable for another. They seem to want to have um, one size fits all and these targets must be adhered to at all cost. And they also have the belief that I don't think has ever been proven that the more money you have and the more you try and save money, the better healthcare will be.